Okay, so welcome back, and we're picking up again where we had left off, and we, we left off on the, the stripping, on the different traits that need to be stripped away from on using this example of this piece of bark, which is representing of us. This, this, uh, these, this bark represents things that are traits that are not conforming to Jesus' traits, and they need to be, they need to be taken to the cross. Mm -hmm. But it has to do with our will cooperating with the Holy Spirit as he reveals these traits to us that don't correspond or conform to the characteristics of Jesus. Right. He wants us to lay him at the foot of the cross. Stop it. Yeah. So if you're, I mean, it's simple. It would be like if you were lying and the Holy Spirit convicts you of lying in Scripture, then stop it. <laughs> then confess it and stop it. That's within your will, yeah. your choice. Roger, you brought up critical spirit recent in the last segment. Crit critical spirit or critical, where we, we criticize everybody, that, what they do and what we see. Well, what's that? We, we put them down. And why do you think most of us that are, have a critical spirit or we, we're very critical in our nature, why do you think we do that? Correct, to lift ourselves up. That's, that's at the root of it. That's in the heart, which we're going to get to, in that because the fire deals with that part. But yeah. that's the we'll trait. We'll get to the motivations of the heart Yeah, the later. motivations of the heart will come later, but um, in process. But we can see that characteristic. And if we're honest with our brothers and sisters when the time's right, and they're saying, well, God's really dealing with me, well, what's he dealing with you on? And he's dealing with me on my, my criticalness. And you, if you're honest, you'll say, well, I love you, but I've always noticed that, that that's an area. But we all have our areas. We're all alike. We have these pieces of bark that he wants cut off. Now, let me just say that you cannot, this piece of bark cannot get made into a straight arrow and bypass this process. You can't go from here to there without submitting to this process. We have millions and millions of Christians right here that have never been taught or they have never yielded to dedicating their life as a... Um, bondservant? Uh, no, not as a bondservant, but dedicated their life as a sacrifice, as a living sacrifice. So have you dedicated your life fully and say, Lord, you can have my life? Because if that has been said, that starts the process. Without that, you're never going to get here. It's not going to happen because you're not dedicated. You're still de more dedicated to your own life. Or maybe you've got one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world. See, there's another false doctrine out there. The false doctrine I mentioned about the doctrine of cheap grace that doesn't require any obedience. Well, there's another doctrine that's false out there that permeates the world. And that, that false doctrine is that I can come to Jesus and have my life too. In other words, I can have what I want. I can go to the altar, give my life to Jesus. I accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of my life. But now I'm going to go live my life and follow my dreams and my ambitions and, and have that ambition to go after my own life not follow him. No, no, a disciple or a believer and a disciple virtually is the same thing. A, dis a believer is a disciple of Christ that follows Christ, but the requirement is they must deny themselves. You can't have it both ways. You can't have Jesus and have your life too. You got to give up your life. That's the cost. That's why Jesus said to be his disciple, you have to love less all these things, mother, father, sister, brothers, we covered a couple of segments ago, or you can't be my disciple. Then in the next, very next phrase, he talks about, so count the cost before you build the house. What's he saying? Count the cost, because the cost isn't going to cost you everything. Everything to have Christ. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So uh, the, the other thing that's in the, a trait that we have in stripping that he wants to strip away is evil association. Evil association corrupts good manners. And be careful about what friends you choose because they can corrupt you. That's in the Proverbs. We have to be very careful 
um, Proverbs 12, 26 actually, that the choice of our friends because they can corrupt us. Mm -hmm. You read earlier in one of the segments on this that about we're supposed to depart from the worldly friends we have. See, it's one thing. He's, God he isn't calling separate us... separate or sever. Yeah. yeah. God isn't calling us so out of the world. Because we've been sent to the world, that's where the sick are. That's where we were. But now our citizenship is in heaven. But we're called to a world of darkness and to help people come out of that darkness. So he's not saying, okay, go and be a monk somewhere and go live on a hilltop and never associate with anybody in the world. No, he's not saying don't do that. But you can't conform to their way of thinking. Right. And if you hang out with worldly people on a regular basis for fun, just to hang out with them, it will eventually corrupt your good behavior. Your dedication that we're talking about will be corrupted. Therefore, your transformation will be corrupted. Therefore, your ability to hear from him will be corrupted and your use in the body will be corrupted. Does that make sense? They all follow suit. So, he's not saying we have, we have worldly friends that we get together with every now and then, but we're always trying to share Jesus with them. It's all about trying to get them into the kingdom. It's not just so we can hang with them. Right. Does that make sense? Okay, that's evil association. Okay. There's, there's lots of these traits, but if God... The Holy Spirit is dealing with you on a trait. Do not say, well, I'll just, you know, God's going to have to change me. This is just who I am. I've, I, I mean, haven't That's you heard that? That's such a cop-out. <laughs> maybe we've done that, but that doesn't count. If the Holy Spirit brings up a, a trait that is not conforming to the character of Christ, he wants us to lay it down. Yeah. That's our responsibility to take it to the cross. Does that make sense? So don't, don't say, well, you know, that's just who I am. If God wants to change, he'll just have to change me. Not without our cooperation. We have a free will. We always have a free will choice in this. Mm -hmm. Okay, next stage. Next stage is sanding. Sanding. Now, sanding, this is with coarse... Coarse sandpaper. We all know what coarse sandpaper is? It's really gritty. Right. Really gritty. Now that's after the bark has been taken off. All those outer traits. Now he's, he's wanting to get this thing smooth. Mm -hmm. Like the arrow here is smooth. So to get it smooth, he's got to take coarse sandpaper and sand this thing mm -hmm. down. Now that's a chastening that hurts. It hurts this little branch. And that's why I said God often allows what he hates to produce what he loves because he's wanting to produce this. But he knows this is going to hurt you, but it's for your best. But I chasten those whom I love. All right, so I remember I had a person that I was working with one time, a client that I was working with, that was used during this stage of our process that was to rub me and in it was coarse sandpaper and this particular person who was my client for he was a new boss that I had to respond to in this big corporation he took over the project that I was producing and he suddenly started holding back my checks I wasn't getting them and he wasn't going to pay me until he made up things that he wanted from me before he would pay. Now I'd been with this client for years and now all of a sudden he's holding up the checks and I've got, we've got children, two young girls that need food and I am livid with this man. I mean livid, praying against him any way I could because he's rubbing me so badly that I, I just, I was just so angry. I was at explosive anger, wasn't I? Mm -hmm. And so bad, it got so bad, I started to develop a cough that I couldn't stop. And I remember there was a, a gentleman that came, and he came from some country. I, I don't even know where he was coming from at that time. We knew him. He was a, had a very prophetic gift. And he came over for dinner one night. And he 
began to notice my cough. And by the end of the evening, he says, you know, that cough you have, it's not under sickness. There's something that God wants that is not yielded to him. He said it's a stress cough. It's a stress cough. You've got stress. And there's something he's trying to get your attention on that you're not, you're not giving up. And now I, and I, he, I knew he had a prophetic ministry and, I, and he had a history of being right on. I bore witness in my spirit that it was for me, but I didn't know what I was supposed to do with that. What am I supposed to do with that? I know you're right. So you had a word of knowledge of what's going on, but now I need a word of wisdom of what do I do with that word of knowledge. So he leaves. And that really stirred the pot. And I'm saying, Lord, what is this all about? I believe he's right because it really irritates me so much. I'm just praying vehemently against this boss of mine for you to take him out of my life. But you won't do it. So why are you allowing this? Don't, Don't you know it's hurting me? Rub me. <laughs> and we have children that need to be fed. And he then began to speak to me. And he said, I want you to love him. I said, what? Don't you understand what he's doing? I want you to love him. I want you to do good to him that persecutes you and abuses you. I want you to pray good things for him. I want to teach you that you overcome evil with good. And I'm using him to produce that quality in you. So I'm allowing him to rub you and rub you until you get the part of my character that I want instilled in you. Does that make sense? And so I said, now it's my choice, isn't it? Now I could at that point say, well, if you want to change the Lord, then you have to change me. As if I have nothing to do with it. And he says, no, I want to change you, but it's not without your cooperation. You have to yield and submit and obey to what I'm asking you to do. Pray for him. Isn't, doesn't my word say that? Don't you pray for your enemy and do good to those who abuse you and persecute you? Well, I don't see you doing it. I see you praying against him. I see you asking me to do whatever you have to do with this guy, God, to get him out of my life because he's hurting poor me. And so then as I started to pray and do good things for him, and really to pray for him, after, it wasn't right away, God was proving me in it, but out of, out of, after a period of weeks and maybe a couple of months all of a sudden he was transferred to another department and he was out of my life and everything was fine again but I knew then what he was trying to do he was scraping me he was stripping me in ways that would change my nature to be more like Jesus that's the that's the, what he was going for right there and that was my nature to begin with by a long shot so he uses the deep coarse sandpaper to go deep into this branch, you and me, to change our nature, to transform us. Okay? See you next time.